Man, I'm pumped about today. We're starting a new series I've been waiting and getting ready to go on. And if you're visiting with us this morning, I am dressed out of character. The reason I am is uh, I'm leaving service today and going to speak at another church. And other churches dress a little bit different than we do. So, <laughs> praise God, i got to fit the part, I guess. Good morning, Poe. I meant to hug your neck a while ago. Man, he's been out and about working, but I've been missing you greatly. It's good to have you home. Praise God. I know you're always with us, but man, don't you just hate it when um, God bless you with a great job and the devil tries to use it to keep you out of church, but hey, aren't you faith? Thank glad that he came. Thank goodness for technology. Welcome our online audience. I know there's people watching with us. Give them a big hand clap because, you know, a lot of people's concept is that they don't come to church uh, because they're lazy. They're just doing it online. No, sometimes you got to work. Ain't that right, Poe? <laughs> sometimes you got to work. I got to be able to, like, and I'm so thankful for our Bible studies every morning at 830. But the truth be told, I'm at work usually at 730. And so I'm catching usually Bible study on my way home. But I'm so glad it's there so I can get it on my way home. Amen? So, man, people used to could use schedules as an excuse but you can't no more. Praise God. Aren't you glad for technology? I'm so thankful for it. Well, we're jumping in on an awesome series today that I've been, I'm telling you, studying, prepping for, and it has been transforming even down to the core of my belief system, train of thought. And I've been serving the Lord for a long time now. I mean, it's like I'm in my latter 20s years serving the Lord passionately, I would call it, and, man, still yet, my mind is being shifted and changed. And so I truly believe this is a series that God is, is destined for now, and you'll understand why. But before we jump into it, this is a very important week um, in the understanding of the church. Reason being, um, one, oh, well, let me just throw out a bunch of Hey, you know, this week is the fair. Anybody plan on going to the fair? We got a booth represented there this week, and if you want to go up and show out and present our church to the city or the county even at the fair this week, Miss Becky, she's kind of heading it out because Miss Doris out of town and Greg is running things, but we've got a booth set up there. We're giving out sunglasses with our name on, giving out pens and giving out waters. And reason being, last year we did this. Greg headed it out. It was Greg's heart. He was in the early service. But we had three families come to church that hadn't ever been to church with us the week after the fair. You say, is that effective? That's pretty effective, you know, to you know, get three new families into the church. And so, you know, what we'll do is we've got a booth set up out there with pens, sunglasses, waters, and we're telling people, hey, we love you, and if you don't have a home church, we'd love you to visit ours. Check us out. And so if you're going to go to the fair this week, swing by our table. We also got a table set up there that says, if you need prayer, we want to pray with you. So, you know, be used there. If you've got 15, 20 minutes, stand there and pray with some people in this city. You understand why more as we get into this uh, series of why it's utmost important. We do more of this stuff. But um, that being said, can I just talk about events going on in the church world um, this week? This coming weekend is uh, the Jewish feast, uh, Ram, uh, what is it, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a, one of the feasts, and I'm going to go real geeky on you. I'm not going to go scholar on you, okay, because I'm not a theologian on end times. And I was telling me and Brandon, we're talking about revelations this morning. Um, I read revelations for the simple fact, not that I understand it, because I am lost when I read revelations. I read it because there's a scripture in the Bible that says you'll be blessed if you do. It's the only book in the Bible that says I'll be blessed if I just read it. The rest of them I have to meditate and know and hide in my heart. And all. If I just read that one, it says that I'll be blessed. So that's a pretty easy blessing to get if you were looking for easy blessings. But um, I got to be honest, I stay lost through it most of the time. But there was a concept God introduced to his people back in the book of Leviticus, and it was the seven feasts that God told the Jewish people that he wanted them to observe. And they're still in observation now. Now, the seven feasts, I'm not going to go geeky on you. There's a bunch of them. There's, a, there's the unleavened bread. There's the uh, atonement. There's the Passover. Well, there's seven in a year's frame. And in the Jewish calendar, you know, they happen every year. And they, the Jewish nations and, um, observe and participate in these feasts. 
Well, these aren't just rules God threw out there in the Old Testament for the children of Israel to follow. They are actually signs and prophetic voices and words and foretelling of Jesus. And the way the, four, the seven feasts work, are there are four that take place in the spring around Easter. Okay, so those are the four at the first of the year. And I'm not going to give you all the names of them. You can Google it yourself because I'm not that scholarly to remember all the names. Right? But, I, so, but there's Passover. Uh, there's uh, the unleavened bread. There's, um, the, but each feast in the Old Testament, scholars believe they were pictures or events of Jesus' life in the future. So the seven feasts are actually prophecies of the work of the Messiah in our life. For example, all right, Jesus died on Passover. In other words, in Leviticus, Jesus said, I want you to celebrate these seven feasts. And so for hundreds of years, the children of Israel celebrated a lot of these feasts, and they had no idea or no understanding on why. God was telling them to celebrate it until Jesus showed up on the scene. And these are not coincidences. There are hundreds of years from the time God gave it to them in Leviticus until Jesus showed up. As a matter of fact, between Old Testament and New Testament, there are 400 years. They're called the silent years. But the, God's people kept celebrating these feasts because they point toward Jesus. Jesus was born. The day he was born was on one of these feasts. That's not coincidence. That's prophetic. All right? Jesus was um, crucified on the Passover. Now, the Passover started back when the children of Israel left Egypt and God told them to put the blood of the lamb over the door and on the post and the death angel would pass over that house. It's not coincidence that Jesus was crucified on Passover the day that the blood of the lamb would cover the sins of the people. All right, then there was, then Jesus rose again on the third feast of the year. And then the fourth feast of the year was Pentecost, was which the start of the body of Christ or the start of the church. So the first four Jewish feasts that God told um, his people hundreds and thousands of years ago to celebrate and observe, when Jesus showed up on the scene, it's not coincidence that every one of those feasts represented something of Jesus' life. All right, now we're moving into the fall of the year, and in the rest of this year there are three more feasts that the Jewish calendar observes and celebrates. And the next is Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And in the prophetic overlaying of the feast versus the life of Jesus, the next event is the rapture of the church. Very important because the Feast of Trumpets is a trumpet sound that God told His people to celebrate thousands of years ago because it was going to represent an event in His plan in His future that would involve Christ in the church. And it's the Feast of Trumpets. Paul said this, that the Lord will return and take His church out on the sound of the last trumpet that will be blown. This weekend is Rosh Hashanah on September 24th on the Jewish calendar. We will, they celebrate Rosh Hashanah. It's unbelievable how many theologians believe. And, you know, they, as a matter of fact, some of the, my favorite ones that I listen to that I can't find there in are saying that the Lord, according to all the prophecies, has to return. The rapture has to take place on Rosh Hashanah. Now, saying, not putting God in the box, God can do whatever He wants, because the Bible says God is the Father, is the only one that knows the time and the day, or knows the exact moment. All right? But there are signs, the Bible says, that we can watch when the day is approaching, it says. We won't know the day nor the hour. But the thing about Rosh Hashanah is we don't know. It, it's not set on a when you get up in the morning date. It's actually set on the setting of the moon and the setting of the sun, which 
don't know the day, I mean, don't know the exact time, hour, or the moment that takes place. But when it takes place, they blow a trumpet, starts the feast. It's a three-day feast. At the end of that feast, when the sun is setting, they will blow another horn, and it will be the last trump that will be sounded in this feast. And prophetically speaking, man, I'm telling you, there's so many respectable theologians that say the Lord's going to return during Rosh Hashanah. Now, that being said, let me take it to another level. This is a, a smit year. What is that? How do you say that, Sister Basta? Smit year, a, a year of seven. That is taught all the way through. The God does, you know, the years of seven have certain things and involves the hand of God in it. Well, not every year is a year of seven. Last year was a year of six. This is a year of seven in the Jewish calendar. And this is what a lot of respectable theologians believe that the Lord has to return on a seventh year because of prophecies in the Old Testament. So if the Lord doesn't return this year, it'll be seven years, they believe, before the rapture can happen because he has to return on a smite year. That being said, has anybody watched the news taking place? I'm sure you have. A lot of it has been overwhelmed and over by all the royal stuff going on over in London and England and stuff. But do you know what they did last week? Blow your mind. All right? So... For almost a hundred years, a red heifer has went extinct on the planet. There was a cow that's called a red heifer, and it's completely red. And they went extinct back in like the 40s. They had all died out. And there hasn't been a red heifer on the planet. And the problem with that in Revelations, it says during the tribulation, the seven years after the rapture, that there has to be a red heifer sacrifice on the altar at the temple. All right? Well, a lot of naysayers are like, well, that can't happen because them are dead. That can, obviously, that's not right. Well, if you were with us last year, you heard me talking about that it's amazing. A few years ago, there was a, a, a cow, a red heifer, born to regular cows. And they checked it out and everything. And it came, it was a legitimate extinct animal that hadn't been on the earth for a long time. So you're stepping back going, whoa, check that out. God, was to fulfill his word, he would bring back an extinct animal. Well, last year, they had these, this red heifer, and there had been five born over the last few years. And last year, they had them all in Kansas. And all of them were in Kansas. And they, have, you know, they, were, they had the Jewish um, rabbis and leaders observing, and they were three hairs away. Three hairs away. I mean, because for it to be considered a kosher red heifer, it has to be down to less than three hairs on an entire cow's body that are red. Does that make sense? It can't have, it's got to be less than three. In other words, us old cows couldn't make it. We got too much gray. All right. But these cows, and they had gotten one that had come down to, they had, it had three hairs that were not red, so it wasn't because Last week, they moved five red heifers from Kansas to Jerusalem that all five of these heifers now are completely kosher according to Jewish experts that they are complete red heifers. You're not three hairs away anymore. They actually have them in Jerusalem. They moved them there last week. Google it and check it out. They moved them there from America to Jerusalem. What do you think they're getting ready for? I'm telling you, say, Cricket, you're crazy. I don't believe that. Hey, there's going to be a day that you're going to wake up and you're going to say, I wish I would have believed what the Word of God said because I'm here to tell you as surely as the sun came up today, Jesus is coming back for His church. Man, and I, it's not a bad thing. It's an exciting thing. I am so pumped. As a matter of fact, um, at my house, I remember growing up, I was so afraid of Jesus' return because there was so one because I wasn't living right. All right? <laughs> if he came, I was going to get left. But then I got to thinking there's all this stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to get married. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to, you know, there were all these things that I wanted to do. And there's still a lot of things that I want to do. One day I want to walk my daughters down the aisle to see them get married. I want to, you know what I'm saying, retire and get old with my beautiful wife. There's a lot of things I want to do, all right? But we're talking with my girls about the return of Jesus. And I know, like, my daughter, she's 13, and uh, she's got even more things I'm sure she wants to do because I'm getting later in life, and I've done a lot of things that I wanted to do. But we were talking, and I was like, Alexis, you know, I know you got all kind of plans and things going, but I'll tell you this. 
when the Lord does return and we go, there's nothing here that you're going to wish you could go back to do one time. Life is going to be so amazing and so great. When Jesus comes and takes his church, that's why he said, don't be worried. Man, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't stress it out. Man, your life's only going to get good when he returns if you're living right and you're saved and you're part of his kingdom. So, man, that stuff's taking place. But this weekend on uh, the 24th, which I believe is Saturday, is Israel will begin to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. And for three days, it's going to be a festival. And like I say, according to theologians, and you say, well, Cricket, I just don't believe anybody could know. Well, did you know when Jesus was born, there were a lot of people that didn't think they would know either, but there were some that were smart enough to look at the signs and see the stars and go. And then there were some religious people that were too stupid to go five miles down the road and witness the, the birth of Jesus. All the religious people were sitting with Herod telling him when, where, how, but they wouldn't be, be a part. So you get to choose whether or not. Yeah, and I don't know if the Lord's coming this weekend. He could come today. He could come. I was telling the early service, the danger about setting it on, on feasts and things like that is like at my house, you know, we have, and iPhones have changed it a little bit because they kind of set their own time, and it's pretty cool. My truck, when I get within Wi-Fi, even if I set my clock to a wrong time, my truck now, the clock in it and date in it will automatically reset as soon as, like when I pull up to my house and it connects to Wi-Fi, even if I have the time wrong on my truck, it resets. It's pretty cool. I didn't know they made vehicles that do that, so I got this one. I was like, check that out. All right, but there's a, my morning routine is this. We get up. I go do my time with the Lord. Then I, from 6, 6.30, I leave. Usually that time I move for, I try to give at least 15 minutes to reading the news. I try to get my news. I used to try to read the news I would get up and read the news, and then I would get in before the Lord, but I found out what I read would affect how I spent time with the Lord if I read the news first. So now I get up and spend my time with the Lord, and then I read the news through the lens of my time with the Lord. And then I jump up, I cook breakfast, I get the girls' lunch while Jennifer's getting hair done and all that, throw the kids in the car, we run them to school. And I noticed that every time we go in Jennifer's car, I was stressed out because we were always late. But it didn't matter. We were all, when we would get there, we would always be early. And, man, the other day I figured it out. Jennifer, we were, we were on our way to school, and we were running late. And when we pulled up there, we were so early, teachers weren't even out on the receiving line yet. And I was like, man, there ain't nobody here, Jen. What's good? And she goes, my clock is 15 minutes fast. <laughs> and I said, what? That's why you have been stressed out every morning because you set your clock 15 minutes fast. All right? So saying that, what if our calendars and our time, what if through history, Somebody dropped a number somewhere, all right? And if you're depending on a calendar to get right with the Lord, what if humans messed up? So what if somebody set your date up early? Now then you, you need to be ready today. Amen. That's what you, you need to be ready today for Jesus to return so that you don't miss it, you don't got to stress it, and your life will only get better. Amen? So, hey, that's a great week this week. The Lord could return any minute. So just telling you, like when we're building toward Easter, I, I like to, you know, get your mind on Easter. I want you to be thinking this week, man, at what all in the spiritual time frame and calendar is going on. Because, guys, we're on a ticking time bomb if you're not saved. If you're saved, you're just waiting for the vacation to begin. Have you ever done that, booked a cruise out long, too far out that... It just gets to be a headache. You're waiting on it to come for so long. You ever done that? <laughs> All right, we, my daughter's birthday's coming up. And so what we, you know, and I don't, I'm just going to tell you this. You know, what we do is we uh, let Lexi pick. She can do a party, she do whatever. But what she wants to do is go to Disney this year. So I'm, we're taking her back to Disney um, this year. And um, that's because her, you know, say that's just what she asked us to do. So we're doing it. The whole family gets to it. But going that way... And it seems like with her, she's like, Dad, my birthday's never going to get here because it's so far out. And a lot of times people feel that way about the return of the Lord. It just ain't going to happen. They've been saying it for years. I'm telling you, it's coming and we're closer than we've ever been. I'm telling you, when you got up this morning, you're closer than you've ever been to the return of Jesus. And when he comes back, I'm telling you. And that, all right, so the next feast, which is this weekend, is, is represented by the rapture of the church. Then the next feast after that represents the second coming of Jesus. 
which is a big, seven years later after the rapture, the return of the Lord is coming. And then after that, we're moving into the millennium. And every, it's not coincidence. God told for a thousand years, celebrate these feasts because big events are going to happen in the supernatural on these days. And so these days are coming. We're on a time clock. Amen? Let me do that. Are you ready to go to the Lord? Are you ready? If the rapture happened today, would you go? And if you're not 100% sure, let me tell you, before this service is over, you need to be rapture ready. You need to be fireproof. I believe in being fireproof. In my house, you walk in my house, i got a fire extinguisher. I've got, you know, um, an exit plan. We've talked about i got smoke detectors. i got my house ready to where if fire were to catch into that house, me and my family are going to be okay. So I'm doing the same thing spiritually. I don't plan on a single family member of mine being in hell. So I'm getting them all rapture ready. And I've learned this. If you live every day rapture ready, if you do die, you got nothing to worry about anyway. Amen? So this is cool times. Cool times. i got a sticky pad on the bottom of my foot. All right. We well, already jump into this series. I've been waiting, and, and I didn't have enough time in the early service. i got a lot of jokes wrote into my message today, too, because I wanted to make this a lighthearted thought pattern as well. But I'm going to be honest, I don't got time to tell you the jokes today. So if you need to laugh to get through this service, just pick a pause or a break at some point in it and just give yourself a laugh, because I'm not going to tell very many jokes in this one today. Because this is a real concept that we're going to, over the next several weeks, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit used me to roll out and lay out for you to be able to get it. Because the truth is, this is probably the hardest concept for an American Christian to wrap their mind around. But if you can't wrap your mind around it as an American Christian, you're forfeiting or giving up a lot and most of the purpose and calling that God saved you for. All right? You can be saved and go into heaven, but miss out on the life that God has here for you on earth. They say it like this, you know, I got saved and now I have a pie in the sky. When I die, there's good news. There's a steak on the plate while you wait available to you too. So you don't have to wait to get to heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this, that we're to pray heaven to earth. That's what we're to do. And he's provided a plan and a way and executed a, a perfect strategy for us as believers to be able, although we live in a fallen world, separated from the presence of God because of sin, to reach into the supernatural, take hold of the will of God for your life and for your family, for our city, for our nation, and, for, and pull it into the natural which would be heaven on earth. That's why Jesus said when you pray, pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning that God wants to use you and me to pull out of the supernatural and bring into the natural the plan, the purpose, and the will of God. Which sounds crazy, but over the next few weeks I want to teach and preach the concepts that Jesus taught and preached the three years that he did. You know, Jesus never preached religion. Not one time. The problem with what we're dealing with as a church, though, is we have reduced the gospel to a religion. Now, let me read you what the definition of a religion is. The definition of a religion is... The worship of a deity. Now, how many of you guys came here to worship God today? Amen. Isn't it awesome? Let me tell you that. Do you realize you're the only creatures on the planet that God created with the purpose and ability to come and bless the Lord? Not just Him bless you. The problem with most Christians is they go through the motions of religion because they want God to do something for them. In other words, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to pay my tithes, I'm going to pray for my you know, needs, I'm, because I want God to fix my situations. And with that concept, I'm here to tell you, we have reduced Christianity down to a religion. The problem with religion is this. If Christianity is a religion, 
then there's no difference in Muslim or Buddhism or yoga or Islam or any of them because they are, are Mormonism. They're all religions. Now, this is what religion is. The worship of a deity through a set of beliefs expressed through a set of rituals, customs, and traditions, producing a certain set of people that live differently than a group of other people choose to live. Now, let me ask you this. Does that describe your relationship with God? Do you come to worship God and you're going to do it through a set of beliefs with a set of rituals? Oh, we raise our hands in this song or you know what I'm saying we clap on this song or we start with worship and sing three songs. Or, is there a set of rituals? Is there customs, certain way to do this, certain way to do that? You know what I'm saying? That somehow by me doing it this way because people have done it that way brings me closer to God. And a, a, a group of traditions, uh, their actual word there, I had to Google it because it was the word right, R-I-T-E, certain rights. And well, that sounds weird because as believers, we, we want rights. Like Americans, we have certain rights. You know, we have the right, we're created equal. You have the right to bear arms, you know what I'm saying? So we, we get to thinking wrongly about rights. So I Googled that word and figured out what that word meant. It meant, in other words, a rite of passage. A lot of, um, a lot of religions have a rite of passage, and ours are like this. One of Christians' rite of passage is walking down an altar and reciting a prayer. How many of you guys were taught when you were a child you need to walk down an aisle and recite a prayer to get saved? That becomes a rite of passage. All right, also, the next usually rite of passage for Christianity as a religion would be being water baptized. All right, another rite of passage for Christianity as a religion would be taking communion. There's a lot of rite of passages in the religion of Christianity, but Jesus never came to preach religion. There wasn't a single message he preached calling people from the life they were living into a religious service because of this. Religion, in a defined definition, is this. Man's effort to get to God. Man, I don't know what you came here for. But are you here today because you came to church to be in the presence of God? Is that what you came to church for? If so, then it's very dangerous that your what you're calling Christianity can be is a religious act. There's a thin line between what the life of a believer is supposed to be and the religion of Christianity. You know, it's real easy for us to call here in America us as Christians, and that's what most belief systems that are built on Jesus Christ call themselves Christians. But did you know it wasn't until Acts chapter 16 when they were in Antioch? The Bible says it was the first place they were called Christians. It says it in Acts chapter 16. It says when they were in Antioch, and this was the first place they were called Christians. And do you know it wasn't them calling themselves that? It was the world calling them that. Now that's a pretty good uh, reputation to have because Christians comes from the word Christ-like. And the church was obviously fulfilling its purpose when the world called them Christ-like. The problem with the Christianity being a religion is the world calls most people that call themselves Christians by another name called hypocrite versus the world calling them Christ-like. Usually the walk in relationship with God in America and Christian church has reduced down to the only people that call the people that go to church Christians now are the Christians. The world calls us no different than them or even worse than them because we have reduced our relationship with God down to the acts that we do resulting in Christianity no longer being and having the identity that Jesus brought it to be 
we now just go through the motions. And the problem with going through the motions is, is it's not what you were created or saved to be. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a concept. And this concept is hard to wrap your mind around. I've been studying and reading and trying to, it's called a paradigm shift back in the 90s is the catchphrase that everybody used. We need to shift our paradigm, meaning that you, we have our, our thinking goes in a certain way or process in a direction. And a paradigm shift is when that shifts in our thought patterns and belief systems about a certain thing completely change into another direction. And what I have found is that most of the believers or Christians I know, me included, are living a life of Christianity religious-based versus being a believer and a Christ follower that becomes kingdom-minded. This series we're on right now is going to be called Living the Dream. Remember a few months before we started Revival, it was called Living the Life. We drew a picture out of the scripture what the life of a believer was supposed to look like. All right, So how we're supposed to live this life. But it doesn't just stop there. Because, see, God's called us to live a dream as well. What a dream is is what you, not the at night sleeping and you ate bad pizza and so you dream like, how many of you guys remember Pee Wee Herman years ago? They said, do you have a dream? He said, yeah, I had a dream it was a donut with the snake wearing a vest on a unicycle riding around that donut. Not that kind of dream, all right? It's, we're talking about a dream of what you know life should be because God's put eternity in your heart and you know that God has great things and greater things and amazing things planned for you. And God has a purpose and a destiny connected to your life that is supposed to outshine the darkness that exists in the world today. I'm tell, can I just jump all in on you real quick? I've been studying this for about three months now. And like I tell you all the time, I try to practice principles before I preach them. Because I don't want to preach something to you that I just find in the Word. I want to preach something that actually begins to take place, take root, and transform my life into what the Word of God says. And I've got to be honest, I wish I would have been pursuing this 10 years ago at this level that I'm pursuing it now because this is a game changer in every part of your life. Let me tell you how it looks in my personal life this week because we're putting these principles to work as a family in my life. All right, so at fifth grade, my daughter, Alexis, heard that there's a, in eighth grade, there's a student body president election. So for three years, we've been here, and I'm going to be president, I'm going to be president, I'm going to be president. All right, and we're like, that's awesome, girl, go for it, go for it. The problem is her school is, uh, has 1,800 students in it, and the, she goes to Foley Middle School, and their seventh and eighth grade is one of the biggest middle schools in the state of Alabama, and so, you know, what they do is they, you do, you had to, if you're going to run for it, you had to serve on a council last year, and then you run in an election uh, at the school. Well, that's a big deal. You know, in an eighth grade world, that's a big deal. And so that's what me and, you know, in the concept of Christian conflict of whether I'm a religious believer or am I a Christ follower, and I'll explain to you what that means in a minute, there should be signs in my, the Bible says these signs will follow them that believe. And we went through this. Do you remember this? Several months ago, we went through signs follow. Well, I've got to be honest with you, my name ain't on the side of any buildings, but there are families in our town that are that way. There's actually buildings at their school that are named after other families in that city. And we're, basically, we're nobody in the city that we're in, we love people, we love God, and we do it. In. But so for my daughter to win that, that was all she won president, student body president for Foley Middle School last week, got voted, and was a landslide. And I'm telling you, that's awesome. So then we say this, and you read my soul, man, that's awesome. God blessed her. All right? So all the students voted, and she was voted student body president. The next day, we didn't even know about this, but all the teachers voted. 
and they voted for a leadership representative for the middle school, and it's called the Red Ribbon Leader, and the teachers vote for basically the president. And Alexis got voted by all the teachers as the Red Ribbon Leader of the Foley Middle School. All right, that's amazing. The next day, all right, the next day, Lexi wanted to enter a, uh, their school's having a sweet potato cook-off. All right, so Alexis wanted to participate in that. So we're like, all right, they sent her home with six sweet potatoes. And so for like five and six hours, Tuesday and Wednesday night, she's baking sweet potato recipe, took it to school. There were like 17, 18 entries out of the whole school. She won that on Thursday, picked to go represent her school in the county. Then with the cash prize on that one, I said, baby, that's the one I would have wanted to win. All right. And a kid in her class said, you win everything. And she goes, I don't mean to. And she's telling this story. His name is Toprak. All right, he's from um, Turkey, his family is. And she goes, I know, I know, because he's a friend. He says, but do me a favor. Don't enter the next competition because some of us deserve a chance to win. All right, that's Thursday. Friday we or Thursday evening, we get sent home with the paper. And my daughter, my other daughter, got voted leader of the month in the elementary school with 1,200 students out of the group. All right, and you say, are you bragging? Yeah, I'm bragging. I need you to understand this. Yes, I'm bragging because this is what God expects our life to do. I, I'm here to tell you, living a defeated life is not what you're called to do. I, and can I tell you, I got the greatest kids in the world. I can tell you, I, I got... I love my kids more than any other kid in the world, <laughs> all right? But I'm not dumb. I'm not one of those parents that believe my kids can't do no wrong because I have to spank them regularly, all right? <laughs> so that can't be... But what's going on? What's going on is God's looking for believers He can put in front of... On, he says, let your light so shine before men. It says, and says that no man puts his light on a stand and puts it under a bushel. You want to know why promotion isn't knocking your door down? It's because are you burning your light at the level you're on now? Because when you determine my main sole purpose is to burn as a light at the position and level I'm at now, it says no man puts you on a stand. God is waiting for your light to burn so he can put you on higher and higher stands so that the higher you go up, the more people can see you. Because it's all about the light. It's not about the Word. Does that make sense? And so, I'm telling you, I've been putting these principles to work in my own personal life. And I'm just like, you ever, you ever met somebody that was on their end of their life and they say, you know, the only regret I had was I didn't give my heart and my life over to the Lord sooner. You ever met somebody that said that? I'm going to be honest with you. The only regret I got is that I haven't started living kingdom principles beforehand. I've been so concentrated on trying to be a Christian. And the truth of the matter is, no matter how hard I kept trying to be a Christian, I kept finding myself failing at it worse. You ever do that? You ever try to be a Christian so hard that you just fail every time you turn around? So then you fail so much at being a Christian, you take a step back because your self-esteem is so beat up that you just decide that you're just happy to go to heaven. You're going to quit trying to strive to reign on earth. But I'm here to tell you, if you're not reigning on earth, all you need is a paradigm shift. You need to change your mind about the way you're thinking. Let's go there. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus introduced this concept. Okay? This is the first message he preached publicly. And he said this. He said, repent... It says, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right? Now, I'm in Matthew 4, 7. It says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another translation to this same scripture says this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Let me explain to you what this concept means. When Jesus showed up, the first thing he told people to do was, the word repent here, the word repent, in our language, we are trained or taught to think we're to ask God to forgive us. That's repentance. That's not repentance. The word repentance actually comes from the word to turn 
or to change direction. Another definition for the word repent is to change the way you think about something. If you're going to, if you're going to repent, you change the way you think. So Jesus showed up, and the first thing he taught was change the way you think because now the game changes. What does that mean by the game changes? All the way through the Old Testament, from the beginning, God introduced himself to creation as all-powerful, all-control, sovereign, one and only God. So when you read through the Old Testament, we see history, and it's been recorded, where people were observers to the power of to the hand and to the might of a living God. And they stood at awe at it. When when Daniel was in the lion's den, he did not close the mouth of the lion. Nebuchadnezzar saw that his God had closed the mouth of the lion. All right? And that's what he called out. He says, your God has saved you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went through the fire. And it says they looked down and they saw God was in it with them. Through the entire Old Testament, God represented and revealed himself, and people were observers to the hand of a mighty God. They stood in awe at his power. They bent a knee in reverence for respect, and those that didn't felt the crushing weight of the judgment of the hand of God. But men were not used by God in the sense of the power of of God. God had all the power. And that took place through the whole Old Testament. God presented himself as a powerful, mighty, good, just, sovereign God. But then something changed. And in the New Testament, God's plan that he had set in place from the moment man was separated because of sin began to be revealed. And God sent His Son, Jesus. Jesus, you need to understand, was fully God. He was not part God or part, you know, the the lower level of God. No. Our God, the Bible says, is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Genesis, we see it says, "Let let us make man in His image. All right? God is a triune being. There's God the Father, God the... But they're fully... God in all of God's glory. But Jesus chose at the beginning of the New Testament to give up his deity existence and not just come down to earth as a man, as a God in a man's suit. The Bible says he became fully man. And yet still he was fully God. But he put himself in the confines of the flesh of a man, not because it was easy to do. Can you imagine giving up all supreme sovereignty and putting it in the flesh of a human body? And he didn't just do it. Check this out. He didn't just do it for 33 years in the New Testament. Jesus is still confined to a body, even there in heaven. That's how much he loved you. He was willing to lay down future existence to be confined from what he was in the beginning so that you and I could have a way to get back to a God that loves us greatly. And so Jesus showed up in the scene, and the reason why he had to show up on the scene fully man was not so that God-man now could walk around and show us how powerful God is. God already did that in the Old Testament. For hundreds and thousands of years, humanity has been in awe at the power of God, separating the Red Sea. The plagues that came upon a nation that turned its heart from God, I mean, just at all. But then Jesus showed up, and he did not show up to show you how powerful God was. What he did was he showed up to show you how now that no longer... Or we're going to have to just be observers of a powerful God. But now Jesus showed up fully man. And everything Jesus did when he was here on earth, 
He did not do as God. He did as a man. Jesus was a man when he raised the dead. Jesus was a man when he healed the sick. Jesus was a man when he cast out demons. Jesus was a man when he rebuked the storms. That messes up our concept because that means that if Jesus the man was able to do that, you need to understand that now God expects you as a man or a woman woman, to be able to do the same. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it. He said, these things that you see me do, you're going to do greater. Why? Because I want to tell you what the purpose of God for your life is. The purpose of God for your life is to represent Jesus to the next generation. Let me explain it to you like this. Old Testament, people observed God. When Jesus came as a man, Jesus showed people how the power that we knew of God in the Old Testament now can flow through a man to a new generation. So he stepped into this new role, per se, that people had never seen God do. So what is that role? Let's lay it out there. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, he said this, Get ready. I'm about to change your way of thinking because now the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has arrived. Things are about to change. The way God has always done things are not going to be done that way anymore. Things are about to change is what Jesus was saying. And what he was saying was this. So I'm going to pattern and show you the example of a man that is in right relationship with God now steps into the calling and purpose that God created him for, and the God that had been viewed from a distance now will be seen flowing through a man. And that's why Jesus became man, so that he could ex put it out an example of how God is to interact with and through you in the future. That's why Jesus said, these signs you see me do, you will do greater. Jesus showed us what a life that is in right standing with God should look like. A life that is in right standing with God should have the authority and the power to bind demons and they leave. To lay hands on the sick and they recover. To open and pray for blind eyes and they see. There are, we are, there are supposed to be signs that follow. Why? Because the principle and the concept that God is trying to introduce that is a mind changer is this. We're not in a religion. We're a part of a kingdom. You've got to understand this. God didn't come to start another religion. God came to bring His kingdom to earth. Just like in days of old, the way a kingdom would expand is it would send out its soldiers and it would send out its citizens into parts and regions that the authority of that kingdom was not in control over and those soldiers and those citizens were to step into new territories that were occupied by non-kingdom uh, identities and they were to take it and what's called advance the kingdom. Am I making sense? It's hard for Christians to get the con or American Christians to get the concept of kingdom because we've never lived under a king. We've always lived under democracy. How many of you guys have been watching the news lately and seeing all the stuff going over in London and England and all that? I mean, I, I read the news and I got to be honest with you, it's first it would cons it consumes my news. I got I flipped through all these stories because I could care less what the princess wore to the the event or and then the Lord started dealing with me. It's like, see, you are so foreign to the concept of kingdom that you don't understand the importance of all that's going on over there because I've never served or been under a king authority. We always think we got a right to say or do in our democracy. And the truth is the American church approaches God in the same sense of a democracy, or we got a concept of dictatorship. Or we got a concept of, you know what I'm saying, other than kingdom. Kingdom is a concept within itself. And there's not another like it. 
And over the next several weeks, we're going to roll out the kingdom because Jesus said this. The first thing he taught when he got here was, look, I'm going to change the way you think because now the kingdom of heaven is available to you. Seventy-seven times in Jesus' teachings in the New Testament, the word kingdom of God is referenced. Thirty-three times in the New Testament in Jesus' teachings, kingdom of heaven is referenced. And truth be told, most of the American church thinks those are the two same things. How many of you guys would say, uh, I mean, I've always thought kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, basically the same thing. It's not. Let me explain to you how it breaks it down into the... Uh, we'll talk more about it over the next couple of weeks, but kingdom of God is a... The Bible says an invisible work. Another scripture said this, that the kingdom of God is not eat or drink but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So what's the definition of kingdom of God? It's not eat or drink. That means it's not anything physical. It's not physical. The kingdom of God is a spiritual work that God does on the inside of us. And that is the righteousness, the right stand for God, the peace, and the joy that a believer is supposed to possess. Now, I love that breakdown he gave us there because it lets me know, it gives me a a barometer, I guess to say, or a a checkpoint to know where my life is. This is what he said. It's not eat or drink, it's not physical, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy. So it gave me a, a stepping plan on how I know I'm into the kingdom of God. Number one is righteousness. Man, to be a part of the kingdom of God, you got to have righteousness. You say, well, cricket, I can't have righteousness. I'm a mess up. That's why the Bible says God gave us the righteousness of God in Christ. What Jesus did for you is a free gift that covers your sin and makes you right standing with God. So every time I come and I lay down my sin and I give it to God and I exchange it for his righteousness, I become righteous. That's where Christianity starts. All right, we get righteous. Do you know what a result of getting sin out of your life is? Peace. Peace. You ever been pulled over by a cop when you were speeding? There's no peace there. No peace. All right, because why? You were doing wrong. You ever had a cop pull you over and you wasn't doing anything wrong? All right, I got it the other day. I, I was coming back from the Pine Bluff campus driving toward Camden, and they'd set up a big roadblock. And they do it periodically, and I pulled up there, man, and I had nothing to worry about. They'd set this roadblock up, and they were checking for drunk drivers. And I knew I hadn't been drinking. So when I pulled up there, me and them cops had a great time. We talked, we joked, you know what I'm saying, because I had nothing to worry about because I wasn't guilty of what they were punishing. The thing about righteousness is when you're... When you, Repent and you get right with the Lord. You're no longer guilty, so there's no punishment. So that brings about great peace. I find believers that don't have peace usually have sin that they're guilty of, and they're hoping they don't get punished for it. But to move into the kingdom of God, man, it starts with getting right. Then you get peace. And like Pastor Jason David preached last week, the result of peace is joy. So I start questioning when I find believers that have no joy. What do they got going on in their life? You know what I'm saying? Because the, the mathematical equation written in the scripture is sin produces no peace and no pity takes away your joy. So it gives me a say, if I don't have joy, first thing I do is I start trying to find out why my peace is robbed. And it usually points back to sin. And if I'll get the sin out, then my righteousness returns. I get back in peace and I can walk in joy. Am I making sense with this? All right, you're getting some out of it. All right, so... That's what the kingdom of God is. It's an inward work. One scripture says it's an invisible work. The kingdom of God is what God did to you and in you when you were saved and gave your life and lordship to the Lord. Right? You became, the kingdom of God came on the inside of you, one one scripture says. It says the kingdom of God is on the inside of you. All right? The thing about that is this. That's awesome, but most Christians are satisfied with that. That the purpose Jesus came was to do a work on the inside of you. problem is Jesus talked 33 times about something called the kingdom of heaven. 
And in this scripture, he said, it's at hand, it's available, it's right here. But most Christians never walk into the kingdom of heaven. What the kingdom of heaven is this. The work that he's done on the inside of you is now brought into the circumstance and the outside of your life. And so you're living in heaven even though you're on earth. In other words, the kingdom of God can stop in your life at the work on the inside of you. But the plan and purpose of God for your life is for you to bring the kingdom that's on the inside of you into the natural world in the area and the places that you live. So can you live on heaven, in heaven on earth? Believers are supposed to. Do you think Jesus' life was bad? Man, if he had a bill, he could catch a fish and it would pay for it. You know what I'm saying? If his friend died, he rose him from the dead. That's not a bad life. You know what I'm saying? That's a pretty good situation. If, if your daughter was sick, she could be recovered. I mean, think of the life that Jesus had. What he did was he came... And he said, I don't do anything that I didn't hear or see my father do. So he represented every day of his life while he walked on earth, he represented the power and the will of God on earth. He represented. You got to get this word. What that means is he represented God in daily life. Does this make sense? Jesus came and set the example for you and I. And when he left, he said, now I want you to do greater. Why did he tell you to do He wants you to represent him to the next generation. What does that mean? He wants you to re-present the power, the plan, and the will of God to this earth now. That concept is called kingdom concept. Because in kingdom thinking, which most Americans don't have, I didn't have. I'm having to retrain my thinking to think kingdom thinking because Jesus never said, join the church, not one time. Jesus never said, join the religion. What Jesus, everything he taught was kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are kingdom concepts that we try to reduce down to religious life. I want to jump now to our story, and we're going to go real fast. I'll be done in 10 minutes, okay? We're just laying out a concept. But here in Matthew chapter 11, we see the conflict of religion versus kingdom at work in a very prominent man that you would think if anybody got it, this man would have got it, but he didn't. All right, it starts off right here in verse 2. It says, and when John, we're talking about John the Baptist now, when John had heard in prison, all right, so where is he hearing this from? Prison. Very important you get this, okay? It says, when, when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, in other words, he, he was in prison, but he heard about all this amazing stuff God was doing, all right? In other words, he was still serving and thinking Old Testament mentality. He, was, he had heard, in other words, he was an observer of things Jesus or God was doing. And no longer are we called to be observers. That concept's got to be gone. The concept of us praying and seeking and asking God to change our situations and God change... You need to understand we're at a time now where God has set up where he no longer wants to just do for you what he wants to do now is he wants to do through you. But as long as Christianity stays a religion, your relationship with the Lord is going to remain at a state or a place. God, I need you to do this for me. Because that is religious thinking. I go to church, I pay my tithes, I worship, I pray, I read my Bible, I quote the scripture, I claim the promises and... God is not working. Why? Because you're trying to get God to move for you. And you need to understand in kingdom thinking, God don't move for you. God moves through you. The authority of a king is passed on to the heir of that kingdom through birth and through blood. So now that we are, and in Revelations 1, chapter 6, 
it tells you what the purpose and plan and destiny for your life is. He says you are called. He has made you, is what one translation says, kings and priests. That's why you say, Cricket, what's the destiny of God? You're called, you were made as kings and priests. Meaning that God doesn't want you to be a Christian. God wants you to be royalty. If you're watching going on over in the other nations right now, over with the, are you watching the Harry Meghan debacle going on? <laughs> All right. Do you know the new king, King Charles, just announced that, king, that Prince Harry's kids are no longer allowed, will not be allowed, RTM will not be allowed to use HRH, uh, the um, royal, um, they will not get royal titles for this reason because they were, even though they were Harry's kids and Harry has stepped away from active duty, their kids are still in line for royalty and the royal name to go with them. But King Charles announced this week because... They will not be giving them titles, royal titles, which means authority. Will not give it to them because they are not going to be in active royal service. That's the qualification for, even though they're in the bloodline, for them to get royal authority and get royal titles and be given royal privilege, they have to be in active royal service. We've watched it over the last year in Kingdom Concept. Prince Andrew, he chose to live a way that dishonored active royal service, and his was taken from him. Have you seen that? Remember, he wasn't even allowed to wear the the blues at the funeral last week. or He was allowed at the funeral, but not at any of the possessions because his actions and the way he lived, and this is very important, the companions that he ran around with cost him the authority as a royal, an act of royal duty servant could have. He lost it. That's pretty sad. Still works in the church today. You want to know why so many believers aren't walking around with kingly authority? It's because they're not acting in royal service. You're called to act and live in royal service. And when you choose because of the bloodline that Jesus served, now you are an heir You are a king and you're a priest and you're called to reign in this life and the next. But your reigning will determine on your concept and your thinking of what it is you're a part of. As a believer or as a church member, did you know that kingdoms don't have members? They have citizens. If your walk with the Lord consists of only church membership, you're in a religion. The problem with religion is it's just like every other religion in the world. It's not going to change your life. Religion is behavior modification for you to try to get close to God. Kingdom thinking is because you were born again, kings are born, and they're born with rights that no man can take away. We are called to rule and reign in this life. But look at John here. And you would think anybody, and I'm going to go real quick, you would think anybody in the scripture that would have got this would have been John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist was the one that when no one else got it, when Jesus came walking up at baptism, Jesus said, I mean, John said, that's the Son of God. No one else there saw it. He was the only one that saw it. So you can't say he was a dummy. He actually had spiritual revelation, and he said, that is the Son of God. He said, I'm unworthy to baptize him. Jesus said, no, no, you have to baptize me to fulfill what God has said is going to happen because I'm not just here as God. I'm a man showing other men what a man that's in right relationship with God can do in this earth. So he was baptized, and John baptized him. And when John baptized him, so he already recognized this is the Son of God. So he went under the water, and when he came out, The Bible says the heavens were opened. Very important word there. This word, the heavens were opened, because it only shows up one other time in the New Testament. And it's it's not a a nice, polite word like we're calling it there. In the original Greek, it's actually a violent word. It's actually the same word that we use when Jesus was crucified on the cross, and it said the veil was rent. That's the same word. The renting, the tearing, the opening 
of the veil is the same word that the heavens were open, rent, tore open. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit came out as a dove, lit on Jesus, and then the voice of God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. All this in a nutshell says this. If John didn't, had lost faith, that he, if he doubted that he recognized it, now there was no doubt. God from heaven split the sky and said, this is my son. So there was no denying this is the son of God, okay? And then the Holy Spirit came through. This is very important. We'll come back here in just a second, but read here. So this is what he said. He said he was in prison, and he was in prison, and he heard about the works of Christ, that Jesus was not doing as God, but was just doing as an example for us as ambassadors to fulfill and carry out later. He said this. He said, so John says, are you, he said to him, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? It's weird we find this place in John's life because what he's doing is it almost appears that he's questioning even if God is real. So what would make a mighty man like this, because this was a mighty man, you'll see it here in just a second, question whether or not God is real. And this is the only thing we can take out of the story that because his circumstances had gotten bad, and they, that he thought they were contrary to what he deserved. Does this make sense? He was in prison, and the Bible says that Jesus came to set the captives free. John knew this. And he's sitting in heaven, I mean, sitting in prison questioning, God, why are you not answering my prayers? Are you not really in control? Do you not really care about what I'm going through? Do you not care that this situation's like it is? Do you not care that I'm in prison and this thing's going bad? Have you ever been there? Have you gotten upset at God saying, God, why are you not doing this for me? I have prayed. I have fasted. I've been going to church. I've been paying my tithes. God, why are you not meeting my bills? God, why are you not working on my behalf? Why are you not healing my mother? Why are you not saving my kids? God, why are you not doing this? Are you really? Does your, are you really what your word says you are? And this was John the Baptist questioning here. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said, he answered them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended at me. He said this, I am the one. Look at the authority that I have. And you don't, you'll be blessed if you don't get offended because I'm not doing it for you. Because this ain't about you no more. This is kingdom concept. Kingdom concept is that we don't serve a God that we observe to take care of us anymore. We are now part of a kingdom of God. And we are to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And instead of serving God through religion to get God to do things for us, we should be a part of what God's doing for others. He said, everything I'm doing, I'm doing it for other people. And you're going to be blessed. The blessing in your life is connected to not getting upset because I'm not doing it for you. I'm telling you, that's king concept. King concept says this, even though I'm in prison, doesn't change the fact that God is on the throne. Even though I'm in prison, even though I'm going through this sickness, even though I'm going through this situation, even if God don't sacrifice or save me, He still came. And I'm going to serve Him as King. And when you understand that this religion isn't for you to make your life better, but Jesus came to give an example on how now the kingdom of God is not work for you, but it is to work through you, it changes the game on how we walk. Look what he said. He said, and I'm going to burn through this. He said, Jesus answered him, go and tell John all these things you're seeing me do for other people. You can always see the kingdom of God at work if you start looking for it and start looking for what God is doing for those around you. Because, see, when you start seeing how God can use you in other people's lives, God will start using you in other people's lives. But see, John was so focused on his situation at this time, he was missing all that God was doing. Do you not think God could use John in that prison to save other prisoners? Paul got it. 
Paul was fully aware and convinced of the kingdom of God mindset. And when he was in prison, the Bible says that even soldiers were standing in line to be able to guard him because of the power of God at work in Paul's life was changing their lives. That's kingdom thinking. Kingdom thinking is this. I'm not serving God for what I get. I'm a part of a kingdom and I have a role to play in his kingdom. And I'm going to step up and be an ambassador. What an ambassador is, they're a representative of a nation that they come from. What a kingdom is, is this. The definition for a kingdom is a, a, a realm in which a king governs and is in control of and it functions like a nation. A king's role is to create a good life for its citizens and subjects, but at the same time advance the kingdom going forward. Good kings take care of its people, and good kings advance the kingdom. Now, the world gets this king concept wrong because our America does. Did you see in the news last week where there was an ambassador from an African nation living in New York representing that nation, and he, he raped his neighbor violently in the hall. Did y'all see that? They arrested him, took him to jail. They wasn't denying. He didn't even deny the fact that he did it. When they put him in jail to, for being arrested for raping his neighbor in the hall, he walked into jail, and within an hour, he turned around and walked out. You know why? Because he was an ambassador. What an ambassador is, when you understand God called you an ambassador, you understand that although you're in a foreign place and in a place of another rule, a governing authority is in control, but because of who you are and who you represent, the same power and the same rules that you lived under there, you live under here. And they had to let him go. He got away with rape, violent rape, in the hall because he was an ambassador. He's already gone back to his country now, and he will never pay for that price because the law is at place under kingdom mentality. That's the negative side. The positive side is this, that you're a king's kid. And you're an ambassador. You don't, you don't live under and are not a subject to the authorities that work at this world. You, although you're a foreigner and a stranger here, you are to rule and reign with the same authority and power that heaven has today in your life. That's why Jesus said this, God will speak to your mountain and tell it to get up and be removed and it'll be cast into the sea. That's not what it says. What's it say? It says, you shall speak. Does it say that God will lay hands on the sick and they recover? No. It says, you will lay hands on the sick and see them recover. As long as you stay in a religion, it will constantly be your job to try to get closer to God and you'll be begging God to do something for you. When you move, hey, Jimmy, man, I love you, sir. I haven't seen you in a bit. You, I tell you what, you're a kingdom's kid, man. God has saved you through so much. I know it's been a rough year. I'm so proud to see you. We are called to be kingdom. Let me tell you the secret. I'm going to close. We're closed. Right? Well, over the next several weeks, we're going to be... There's 26 kingdom principles. There's six kingdom concepts. And over the next four weeks, we're going to go because this is what your life is supposed to look like. I'm telling you. It's not coincidence my kids won all that last year because let me be honest with you, they're not that good of kids. I love them and I'll fight you if you say that, but I can say that because I know them. But I can tell you this, it's nothing but the hand of God at work on their life, positioning them to rule and reign because they understood and they have grown up under kingdom mentality. They expect to win. They expect to be the head and not the tail. They expect to be above and not beneath. Why? Not because we raise conceited kids, but we have taught them who God is. And we watched God for years in the Old Testament. And we're inviting God to flow through us in this New Testament life that we live. And you are called to rule and reign. You are not called to go out of this world with cancer. You are called to rule over that. You're called to rule and reign. Your life can shift. And it's not, the Bible says that as a man thinketh, so is he. So I know this, that as long as we keep our mindset set on that, I belong to a church and I worship God, that's a religion. Till you understand that you're a, these are three things that you're going to be full clear on when you, we finish this. Number one, there were three things Jesus had that changed everything. And when he walked up in a storm, was trying to stop what God had called him to do, he had authority to speak to him. That's a kingdom authority. 
When a demonic spirit would try to stop what they, he would cast it out. When someone would die and it would make the king look bad, Jesus rose him from the dead because, you know why? Because he was under the authority of a kingdom mentality. You were not called to be a Christian. You were called to be a priest and a king. That's why Jesus is the king of kings. He's not the king over all the kings in the world. When you got saved, you became a king. And that's why he's your king. And he gives all authority. The Bible says, I give all authority to you. And so we're going to learn what that means. I understand you're not getting it, but this is the three things. Jesus walked into this lifestyle by doing three things. Jesus didn't do any miracles before baptism. All right? So in that story, that would let us, if you read on down to this story, this is what it says. Uh, and we didn't get there. Time, I don't know where it went. But he said this. He said, blessed if you're not offended that I'm not doing this stuff for you. The devil takes so many people out of the walk and the plan that God has for them out of disappointment, unbelief, and God not doing what they want God to do. So they turn their heart, but they don't understand kingdom mentality. They the Understanding king mentality is this. God is good, says that in Psalms, and he can only do good. The only time the devil's ever been able to stop someone from representing God in kingdom thinking is when he convinced them that God was not a good God. That's how he got Adam and Eve. He convinced Adam and Eve God was not good. He's holding out on you. There's part of life that God don't want you to enjoy. And when Adam and Eve believed that lie about the king, they lost the authority of the kingship that God gave them. So we've got to go back and get this mentality that Jesus had. This is what it says. When Jesus was baptized, first thing he did was he went under the water, which represents being washed, the sin being washed away. Now, Jesus did this only for our example because he had no sin. He only was allowed him to baptize because he had to set the example. Why? Because Jesus' life showed us what a sin-free life can do. I'm here to say that's one of the first. A sin-free life, there's no bounds that God can't use. The sad thing about it is this. You say, well, Cricket, we won't ever get to where we're living sinless. You're probably right. But there's a difference in living in sin and messing up every once in a while. See, there's a dangerous teaching in church that says grace gives you a license to sin. That God for you. No, you need you got a wrong concept. Grace doesn't make sin, okay? Grace gives you the power not to. And so when we live a sin-free life, number one, it positions us to have God flow through us. You say, well, Cricket, how do I live a sin-free life? Never be okay with sin, and when you do it, you repent. You bring it to the Father. And 1 John 1, 9 was written to Christians, not unsaved people, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. I'm telling you, when you are right standing with God, God can flow through you and you will have signs follow. That's number one, sin-free life, or strive for it. Number two was this. It said that he was clear and understood and God reinforced his identity. The Holy Spirit could have just came down and done it and lit on him, but it didn't. God had to say, this is my son. Why? Because the devil had been lying to him for 30 years that he was just a regular old person. But God don't mind telling you who you are. And I'm here to tell you this. Your circumstances are not the same as who God says you are. Gideon was a mighty man of valor, although he was being a chicken in the smallest of the small. If you don't ever find out your identity from your father, you're never going to be a king. That's why Harry's problem is right now. Harry's walking around mad at his daddy because his daddy didn't give him what he wanted in all of the interview. He's a prince. He could be sitting over there ruling and reigning in line to take the throne, but he's got so many daddy wounds because where he thinks his daddy let him down. You need to get to a place and understand that if God ever let anything happen in your life, you give God enough time and it's going to be good because God is only good. Any area of our life that we lack faith in is because we don't have a revelation of how good God is to us in that area. But then he understood who he was. You're going to, when this series is over, you're going to understand you're not just a normal person going through normal life. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are an heir to the king. You are a child of the king. You are a king and a priest yourself. And God put you here to represent him 
and to release his power into this earth. You're to walk onto the job. I loved it. Miss Bash, the first thing she did was came in here to me this morning and said, I was at Walmart and the lady was saying she had a headache. I stopped and said, can I pray for you? She prayed for her right there in Walmart and the lady pulled up and said, I can work, make it to the end of the day now. So that's what kingdom authority is. That you understand that you're the answer to all the brokenness that you see. When you walk in, God wants to use you to bring heaven to earth. God wants to use you to lay hands on the sick. God wants to use you to love others that are unlovable. God wants to use you to represent him, represent him to a person that doesn't know the goodness of your king. So he had identity. But then thirdly, this is what he did. He had the power of the Holy Spirit at work in him. When it said that heaven was torn, remember I said rent? That's a violent word. you got to understand what happened there. When we look in the heavenlies from back from that moment, we see this. that The Bible says the devil is the prince of the air, correct? He's the prince of the air. Also, we see in the book of Daniel that when Daniel was just praying, begging God to do something, God released him. In the Old Testament, God was going to do it for him to show his hand. But when the angel was bringing the answered prayer from heaven to earth, the Bible says the demonic spirits began to fight that answer and held it back from getting through. So up to that point, the Holy Spirit didn't have the right to be here because of our sin. So when Jesus showed up at the scene, the Bible says that God rent the heaven. Same way when Jesus died on the cross, it says he rent the veil that separated you from God. He rent the heavens and allowed the Holy Spirit to come and sit on Jesus' life. And from that point on, Jesus walked around messing up the world system everywhere he went. He messed up so many funerals that were thinking they were going to go this way. But because he was there and now he had the authority of the king on his life, he could turn the way that funeral went. He already even messed up his own. He got to his and decided, all right, I'm dead long enough, let's go. And the Bible said it was the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. The Holy Spirit raised him, now dwells in you. And so you're going to have to get an understanding of what the power of the Holy Spirit can do on the inside of you to the world that you're on the inside of. In this series over the next few weeks, I'm praying that God prepare us, change us, and allow us now to actually walk in kingdom authority. I'm telling you, it changes everything. I'm walking out of here today and I'm going to another church that don't love me like you guys do. And I'm expecting the Holy Spirit to be there when I'm there and use the words that we're going to share. Why? Because not I'm a great speaker. They, they had everybody. They, I think they picked me so that, you know, a lot of times, can I be honest with you? When I used to speak at conferences, I would call and make sure I got behind the worst speaker I knew was going to be there. <laughs> you know why? So at least if I was, at least I could, somebody might think I was, at least he's better than the last guy, all right? And that's what I'm figuring they're doing at this event today. They're going to get somebody, at least he's better than the last guy, all right? But I expect the Holy Spirit to show up and do something, even if I blow it, because I'm a king's kid. This kingdom authority that you have available to you will change everything about your life. You'll start walking in a new realm. The Bible says I've given all authority to you. But most of us don't use it because the truth is this. We're still wanting God to do something for us instead of us willing to step up and take our a position in active royal duty. It's called active royal duty. God puts you on that job for you to represent God on that job. You're to walk in tomorrow and bring the power of God with you. If there be any sick there, you're to lay your hands on them because God's sending ambassadors into a fallen world but he sent he, Jesus said I'm not sending you alone I'm going to send the Holy Spirit with you that will empower you and flow through you so we're moving into kingdom amen are you ready I'm so excited about the next several weeks because it will change everything but what's the first step the first step was exactly like Jesus you're never going to do it without a sin free life and you say cricket I don't know if I can ever. no you don't got to be what you got to move to a place mentally is, King, that sin is not okay. And I'm not going to be all right allowing it to stay in my life anymore. You say, well, Cricket, I keep doing it. Paul said, that thing I don't want to do, I do. That thing I do want to do, I don't. But Paul never quit bringing it before the Lord, laying it on the altar and exchanging it for forgiveness. You keep asking God to forgive you. You keep confessing it as sin. The minute you change its, its definition or terminology from sin to okay, 
then you lose kingdom authority. It's when we're okay with sin is when we're in a mess. When we confess sin, man, you will never exhaust the blood of Jesus. It will wash it all away. All right, but then you got to find your identity. And your homework this week, Psalms 139, you read it every single day this week. I challenge you. See if it don't change who you are. You need to know who God sent to fix this world is. We think God sent Jesus to fix the world. No, God sent Jesus to show you how you can fix the world because you're a king's kid and you have kingdom authority. And then thirdly, we're going to move into receiving and accepting the power of the Holy Spirit that God sent him here to do. Amen? That's what we're going to do. And they say, I want to pray with you real quick. If you're here, you say, Cricket, I'm sick of losing, sick of being the tail. I'm ready to be there. It starts with you confessing your sin and asking God to cleanse you. This is what the Bible says this. All right? Matthew chapter 11, Jesus lays out this mentality. He says, what you're not, what is not kingdom thinking. He says, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to, where you're going to go. That's what he says. Because the truth be told, religion makes us say, God, I need you to bless me. I need a new car. I need new clothes. I need to pay that bill. Jesus said, quit thinking that way. He said, you got to start thinking this way. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then it says this, and his righteousness. And it says, all these things will be added to you. All them things you've been worrying about in religion will come to you when you move into kingdom concept, and that's this. Man, I start looking for God's way of doing it. How does God want me to interact with Janet? How does God want me to act on the job? How does God want me to talk to that person that don't know him? I start looking, seeking God's way of doing things and his righteousness. I repent and I bring before the Lord my sin and confess it as sin, call it sin, and leave it on the altar. And next time I mess up again, I call it sin again. I just don't call it okay. Then I become the right. It says, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. It says, if we'll seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things, then the Holy Spirit can begin to flood. You know, we're going to talk about it. Right, you know why the Holy Spirit's not using you to heal people now if you got sin in your life? Because the, sin, the Bible says the Holy Spirit can be quenched, held back, pushed down, and it can be grieved. I don't know. You know the Holy Spirit is the Godhead that has female um, qualities. And I know this. If I treat Jennifer wrongly, I'm probably going to go a couple of days without having a good conversation with her. You know what I'm saying? Because, man, I tell you, women can, women, when you, when you do a woman wrong, it grieves her. It grieves her. The Holy Spirit's the same way. He's got the feminine qualities of the Godhead, and he can be grieved. So when I allow sin in my life that he's already dealt with in me to stay there, I grieve him. And when he's grieved, he gets quenched. That means he's being held back from releasing the power that he wants to in your life. Am I making sense here? We're done. We're gone. All right, so I want to pray with you real quick. If you say, Cricket, I'm here. Man, and there's sin in my life, and I've just gotten okay with it. Your first step in the kingdom mentality is you striving to be sin-free. And the way you become sin-free is you confess your sin. It says he will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, but he don't just forgive. This is what it says. And cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, it puts you back in royal standing. If Harry would just get on TV and say, I'm sorry for the way I treated the crown, every one of them royals would take him back wholeheartedly. You can almost see the tears in his father's eyes every time you see them talking about Harry. And the dad, King Charles won't say a bad thing about Harry. Isn't it amazing? Because that's the heart of a father. And if that's an earthly father, your father even cares more about you, the king. He never thinks anything bad. He's just waiting for you to say, I'm sorry that I've done this and I want to be back right with you. And boom, the Bible says it's over. You move back into active royal duty. Amen? God wants to use you to save that coworker. God wants to use you to heal that grandma. God wants you to use you to witness to that child. God wants to use you as his heir, his ambassador. And just tell him, let me tell you a secret too. You're not going to do it without the church. You know there's a position in king of old that's called the, the one that was closest to the king, had the greatest, he had a special name. You know what that name was? The hand of the king. That meant whatever and wherever he went, he carried the same authority as the king and he had the power to carry it out. God wants it. The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. The church is the hand of the king. The thing about it is, a lot of us want to 
be a king's kid without being a part. Let me tell you what the church is. All right, so the Bible says we're aliens, we're strangers. We're going to get a lot of it, but it says this, that the church is like an embassy. You know what an embassy is? It's a place in a foreign country. Let's take America, for example, that is a piece of ground in a foreign country that America owns. And even though it's in a foreign country under the rule of foreign government, if an American citizen in that country gets to that embassy, then it don't matter what the law of that country says. The law of America kicks in, and he is protected by the law, the government, and the authority of America all over the world. The church is an embassy. That's why the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I'm telling you, people that disconnect themselves from the church, you know, it's like if you go to another country and you break the law, if you can, this is the truth, if you're in another country and you break the law and you can get to the embassy before the authorities get you, you'll be protected if it's not illegal in the United States because you're under authority. Same thing works. If you're living this world and the enemy gets after you out there, if you can get to the church, the laws of the kingdom go into work. And that's why the Bible said, if there be any sick among you, bring them to the elders of the church, have them lay hands on you, pray the prayer of faith, and they will recover. See, there's laws at work under kingdom and under authority. So that's what we're going to go after. I want to pray with you real quick. If you've got a sin, I'm telling you, it's why God's power, authority, and work can't go into your life like you want it to. It just needs to be confessed up. Let's confess. Father God, I ask you, and I choose to confess this area of my life of sin. I'm sorry for making it okay to allow sin in my life. And I confess it as sin. And I ask you right now, Father God, to forgive me for it. Your word says you will cleanse me from all sin and unrighteousness. So I thank you that right now that I have right standing before you. And now that I have right standing with you, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come and feel every part of my life and flow through me just like your word says you can. Lord, I thank you that you are revealing to each person in this church today their identity. And over the next few weeks, they will never look in the mirror the same. They will only see royalty when they do. I thank you, Father God, that you've called us to something greater. And our life will only get better from here in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me tell you the way the Holy Spirit works. So we always want the Holy Spirit to do something for us. The Holy Spirit, the Bible calls like water. But in the New Testament, it changes its name, his name to a river. A river. Do you know what rivers do? They flow. The purpose of kingdom is the power of God to flow through you. We want it to flow to us. Oh, well, God, I need you to fix this and heal this. When you move into kingdom concept, you say, God, I want you to flow through me to save my boss or flow through me. Everything changes. And we'll talk about this too, even with money. Because, see, God don't mind flowing through you to meet a need. And the, pro the awesome thing about it is he lets you keep the residual. Isn't that pretty awesome? <laughs> he lets you keep the residual. He don't mind flowing through you. And you get to keep it too. Amen? So I'm excited, guys. And I don't know like, if you're as excited as I am, but this will change everything about your life if we can just change, repent the way we think about what it is we're a part of. Amen? God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed. Enjoy your week. Go out and live like a king, all right? God bless you.